Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen. Today we're gonna to make pretzels. Um, something that I really enjoy eating, something that I enjoy making, uh, something that I'm a bit of a disaster at making. Um, but I keep trying because I really enjoy the process and I enjoy eating them. So into the bowl of our stand mixer, I put some bread flour. And next in, I'm gonna put some rye flour. Now you don't have to use rye flour if you don't wanna buy it. You could use all bread flour. I find that the rye flour adds a uh, flavor that I really like in pretzels. Next in is just a tiny little bit of brown sugar. And you don't want too much, you just want a little, little bit just to give a tiny bit of flavor. Next in is some salt. And at this point, I'm just gonna take a spoon and give that a stir, mix the salt in. Because the next ingredient is instant dry yeast. And yeah, I hear you. Your grandmother always told you that salt kills yeast and you should keep them separate. Um, technically, yes, salt kills yeast, but in uh, the concentrations found in most typical bread recipes, it's not a problem. And in fact, um, as much as salt kills yeast, so does sugar. In a high enough concentration, sugar will also kill yeast. And I see people throwing sugar at yeast all the time. Next in is some butter. Um, I put my butter in at the beginning of the process. Uh, a lot of people will put it in halfway through after they've already mixed it together and they're just starting the kneading process, sticking the butter in. You could do it either way, whichever way makes you feel the most comfortable. Next in is diastatic malt powder. Now, it sounds fancy. It certainly does sound fancy, but it is just flour made from malted barley. And I'll explain that. So barley is a grain. Um, barley is usually malted, which means they sprout it. So they get the barley wet, they allow it to sprout. As soon as it sprouts, they put it out on a floor and they dry it. And what's happening there is when the barley sprouts, um, it starts an enzymatic action inside the seed and the sprout where it the enzymes start to turn complex sugars into simple sugars that the sprout can use to grow. What humans figured out a long time ago was that this enzyme that converts those starches and complex sugars into simple sugars is also really great for feeding yeast because yeast eats sugar, but yeast eats very specific types or, wait, the yeast that we use for baking and brewing and distilling use very specific types of simple sugars and not complex sugars. So the malt powder, what it's going to do in this instance is the diastatic part means that, this is really complicated, so I'm geeking out. I'm gonna geek out for a moment. Excuse me while I've geeked out. The diastatic part of diastatic malt powder means that those enzymes are still active. They're available to use. So what's gonna happen is in here, when I put the water in, the enzymes are gonna start working to convert the complex starches and complex sugars of the flour to simple sugars that the yeast can use. Um, which is a really long-winded winded way to say that the yeast is going to be able to better consume the flour, it's going to work harder, and we're going to get better flavor because the yeast is happy, and happy yeast gives you good flavor. That's something that, uh, that I learned the hard way, brewing beer. Okay, put the mixer hook in, turn the mixer on low, and just bring this together into a kind of ragged ball on low before we turn it up a little bit to do the kneading. So a bit of a ragged ball now, and we're gonna turn it up just a little bit and start kneading. So I think this mixer's just about done. Um, this is like the third or fourth KitchenAid stand mixer that's broken on me in the last couple of months. Um, I just tore down one of these, one of the silver ones, uh, and filmed it. And I'm just waiting for parts to come in so that I can put it back together. So I don't know if this video will be up first or if the repair video will be up, be up first. But if you've ever wondered how to fix one of these, um, I've got a video coming out shortly about that, so take a look for it. So I'm going to take this out and I'm going to put it out on the bench and I'm going to knead it just a little bit by hand just to see where we're at. And even if the mixer hadn't given up, 
Uh, this is a step that I always like to do anyway, just to kind of get a feel for the dough and see where we're at with the kneading process. And you know what, I think this, now I hesitate to say that this is perfect, but it feels really nice. So I'm gonna make it into a ball with a nice smooth elastic surface. That looks pretty good. And the same bowl that we mix it in. You don't need to wash it out. You don't need to put any oil in it. You don't need to do anything to it. You can just put the ball back in, cover it in a tea towel, and we're gonna let this rest for 15 to 20 minutes. This isn't necessarily a rise. Um, the yeast will start to act. This is more about letting the gluten relax so that when we move on to the next step, it's not gonna pull back on itself. So see you in about 20 minutes. Okay, time is up. Dough has rested. Now you could have put plastic wrap over this and stuck it in the fridge for a day, day and a half. And what that would do is the dough would very slowly rise, but it would develop an incredible amount of flavor. And since everything that you do in the kitchen should be about developing flavor, if you have the time, I would highly recommend doing that. Um, it, is, it is a great way to make a better textured and better flavored dough. But of course, you know, I didn't really have time today, so I didn't do it. The goal now is I wanna get this into a rectangle or as close to a rectangle as I possibly can so that we can portion it out to start the shaping process. Now my goal is to make a dozen pretzels and um, generally I'm trying to get to about 110 grams per pretzel. I weighed my dough today, I have 1,356 grams of dough, which means each pretzel will be 113 grams. So I'm off by a little bit, uh, which isn't too bad. Actually, that's, I'm gonna call that a win. So I'm gonna cut this into 12 pieces and see where we can get. And you don't have to be too spreadsheety or pedantic about it. Um, you know, as long as you're close, eyeballing is good enough. Now, because I flattened it into a rectangle and cut them out, I've got pieces of dough that are kind of rectangular. And you almost want to leave them in this shape. You want to kind of roll them just a little bit so that you start to get that rope feeling. But for the most part, these are pretty good. And I'm just going to put them onto parchment lined baking sheet. And I've got one here that's already done. Cover it with a piece of tea towel and leave it to rest for 10 15 minutes that lets the gluten relax and then the actual shaping should be a whole lot easier alternately one of the things that I've seen people do is this they'll flatten it out and then fold in and pinch down like you were making a loaf of bread and maybe fold it over like three times pinch it down and then you've got this rope and that's what you set aside to let rest for the next 10 minutes. And you'll get better over time. Well, that's the theory anyway. <laughs> I, I don't know that I have actually gotten better over time. And roll it and pinch it, roll it and pinch it, roll it and pinch it. Okay, I'm gonna keep doing this. Let it rest for 10, 15 minutes, and then I will see you for the next stage. This is the part where it usually goes completely wrong for me. Um, so don't feel bad, don't give up, just keep trying. Put your rope down on your counter. You don't want any flour on your bench. You want it to stick to your countertop a little bit and that resistance will help you draw it out. Hands on either side, leave a section in the middle that you don't touch and you're never gonna roll and just roll it out and then come back to the center, same sort of thing, and just do it again. And you can flip the center pretty violently back and forth, and that's gonna help you get the shape that you want. And it's gonna draw back a little bit. When you let go, it's gonna snap back in. Don't worry about that too much. If it snaps back more than, say, a third of the way in, uh, you haven't let your dough rest long enough, let it rest a little bit longer. So, I get it out this far, and then, um, I'm going to do it all on the bench because I find that easier than watching the twirly thing. Make it into a U, draw it over once, draw it over twice, and then pull these back, press it down, 
and move to a sheet tray. Okay, here we go. Let's try this one. So, into the center, put your hands in, put your thumbs in, leave a space in the middle where you're not touching, and you roll and you pull your hands apart. And then come back into the center and do it again. And just keep pulling your hands apart. And you want it to taper down at the ends. And the thing that I find most difficult is getting my pull even on both sides of the center part. Then I bring it into a U, cross over, cross over, bring it back, pinch it down, and you've kind of got a pretzel. Now I put a little bit of plastic wrap or cling wrap over top of the tray with the finished ones so they don't dry out. Um, and I've got a stack of cookies here. Have you checked out our killer infused cookie recipe? These chocolate chip cookies um, are absolutely incredible. Fantastic cookies. Check out that recipe. So I've got some here with some tea because often this takes me a lot longer than I thought it would. Now I've got, um, I've got a few more to go, so I'm just going to keep shaping my pretzels. Now, I'm just going to do it on the bench. <laughs> and so these will sit out on the counter for about a half an hour. And then once that half hour is up, I'm going to stick them into the fridge for at least an hour. But they could stay in the fridge overnight if you wanted to leave them that long. And that would give the dough time to develop some really great flavors. But I need these today. So half hour on the counter hour in the fridge and then we'll come on back and we will dip them in the lye solution. Until then, I'm going to have a cookie while I wait. The next step is to dip the pretzels into a solution of water and sodium hydroxide or lye. Um, this is the traditional method for making pretzels. And I don't want to overstate the dangers of, of what you're doing here, but you do have to be cautious. You need to wear gloves. You need to be very aware that this is a highly alkaline solution, incredibly caustic, and if you get it on yourself, you could get a chemical burn. But this is the traditional way of making pretzels. And so you do need to be careful. Wear your gloves. Um, be very aware of what this liquid is doing. Don't fear it. Respect it. That's very important. Um, a lot of people are going to be writing in the comments that they just use baking soda because they're too afraid to use lye or they don't know what lye is or they're terrified of it. Um, I've never found that baking soda does what I want it to do. Um, you don't get a nice crust on the outside. You don't get a really nice brown. So I th I've given up on it. Um, other people will say if you take the uh, baking soda and you put it on a baking pan and you bake it for a couple of hours, it changes the alkalinity, and it does. And you do get a fairly nice exterior, but still not fantastic. Still not happy with it. So, you know, why... Um, why balk at tradition? Just do what is traditionally done. And uh, this stuff is fairly easy to get. I got mine from Modernist Pantry. Um, ordered online. Now the pretzels don't have to be in the water very long. Five seconds on each time. Just enough to soak them a little bit. And then they can go back on the baking tray. Make sure you have parchment paper or silp hat on your baking tray. It would absolutely be best if you used a plastic container or stainless steel and not glass. And the reason for that is glass can etch, um, which would make it weaker. And you don't want that to happen. I'm doing it in glass just so it's easier for you to see what's going on. Um, but truthfully, plastic or stainless steel is the way to go. So second tray. 
And then while they're still damp, sprinkle on some salt or other toppings, whatever topping you want to put on. I mean, they're your pretzels. Make them the way you want. Um, but a nice big flaky salt is what I like. These will go into a preheated 425 degree oven for about 20 minutes to bake. And you know they're done when they reach an internal temperature of 205 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Into the oven. Hey, Jules. Right on cue, it's time for pretzels. Pretzels. So, some of them the shape. I was going to say. It's not so great. I mean, whatever. Your tying skills are, I need practice. Yes. Uh, but and, that's okay. And because you don't make them, if I made them every day down at my job at the mall, yeah, it would be, yeah. But, so some of them are pretty good. Some of them, you know, not okay, so good. Okay, but really, in the end, I don't care how they look. <laughs> to be it's, honest, it's, I don't care how they look. It's how they uh, taste. How, let's... And so, one of the things I really like about them is that some edges are crispy and some are really nice and bready. I can hear the crispy just listen to you. Mm. Tastes like a pretzel. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right away. So, dipping it in the lye is what gives you this nice glossy brown color. Okay. <laughs> but it's also what gives you that flavor, that pretzel flavor, as soon as you put it in your mouth. Is that tang? Yeah. And you're not going to get that. Tang's not the right word, though. No, but it's it's kind of okay. I know what you, I know what you're talking. It's like yeah, I don't it's know, the stringent's not the word either. But mm -hmm. so you're dipping it in an alkali, which is the exact opposite <laughs> of an acid. But, yes. But you get the same sort of effect. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to get that with baking soda. You're not going to get that with baking soda that's baked. Um, you're, the only way you're going to get it really is with lye. Or you might try kensui, um, which is something that the Japanese use for making ramen. But um, and then you mix it with the salt. Yeah, lies lies the way to go. Th these are really good. So I mean, dip them in butter. If you want to dip them in butter? Um, a lot of people dip them in mustard. Have them with a jug of beer. Mm. Whatever brings you joy. The inside of the. Puffy part's really good, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon.